a series called Meaningful Meals. Uh, because November is a time known for uh, lots of things in our nation, for Thanksgiving, of course. Uh, and we're not commanded to celebrate that holiday, but I encourage the child of God to always be thankful and to be giving thanks. But also of meals. And we'll have a meal tomorrow. And as I told my students on the last day before they left, eat turkey. Don't be a turkey. Somebody say amen. amen. Uh, but we've been in a series called Meaningful Meals. And we've been going through some meals that are mentioned for us in Scripture. And up until this point, we've been in Old Testament passages, Old Testament meals. And we've not only looked at the situation in which they occurred historically to glean a basic outline of the Old Testament. If you go listen back through these messages, you'll see there's a basic outline laid of all the Old Testament historically in these past meals. So a little cursory outline, but an outline nonetheless of the passage of time all the way from Genesis until basically the end of the Old Testament as we come to, to know it. Um, as the people of God are going to come back from being in captivity. And so, so far we've been in these Old Testament meals. And the first meal we looked at was Isaac's meal. Where Isaac called for Esau, his son, to go out and make him a meal. And that meal was going to be served to Isaac. And Isaac was going to bless Esau with a blessing that Isaac, truth be told, knew God wanted to go to Jacob. And so as we went through that passage, we looked at how... There was so much fault to be found with Isaac and with uh, Rebekah and with Jacob and with Esau. And yet through it all, now we know God is in charge to be sure. And the main thing we looked at from that meal with all of the aspects of it was how Jacob, whose name means supplanter, one who takes the place of somebody, supplants somebody, how it is that that points to Christ, who aren't you thankful he took the place for you and for me. Yeah. Yeah. And then we fast forwarded into the Passover meal and how it was that the lamb was to be slain and how that meal in itself, so many aspects of it point to Christ and to his ministry and to who he is, that not one bone could be broken. It had to be a spotless lamb that had, was unblemished. It had to be a lamb that was close to the family. It had to be, have its blood on the top of the door and on the sides of the door. And of course, the blood would spill down and you get all the way back in the book of Exodus by the blood at the top of the door, the sides of the door and as it would fall down to the ground you get the shape of the cross all the way back in Exodus. Only God could be so brilliant no man could pull all of that together as to have such a foreshadowing of the ministry of Christ. And then last week we had what we called a three course meal where we went to, uh, we went to three different passages. One was the widow of Zarephath and how she was used to provide for Elijah. And so much to be found in that passage. But uh, the main thing is that we looked at is it foreshadows uh, the ministry of Jesus. Especially to us as believers. That what never ran out during the time of that drought. What never ran out was the uh, grain and the oil. That, and aren't you thankful that God supplies us the bread of life. And he supplies us of the spirit. And he's faithful to do that for his children. Aren't you thankful for that? From a well that never runs dry. And then from there we went to Daniel's meal. How was it Daniel went in captivity? Him and his friends that we call Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They didn't want to eat of foods that were forbidden from them in the Old Testament law. And they didn't eat from that. So they ate what was acceptable in the eyes of God under Old Testament law. And rather than lose weight and be diminished, they actually were the healthiest of the bunch. And we looked at not only is God's way better than the world's way, but we also looked at this truth that it goes back to the Old Testament, back to the Garden of Eden, where the first Adam ate of the forbidden fruit, did he not? And as a result, the, the fall of man happened, and indeed the fall of the created order with man being as the crown of that creation. But yet Jesus, aren't you thankful? He did not eat of the forbidden fruit. But what he did do was take the curse upon himself that we might be forgiven Amen. and free. Thank you. And then we looked, the last part of last week's meal was at Esther's meal. Where it was that she being the queen of Persia, God's people were going to be wiped out. And yet at the meal that she had, this man that was against God's people, Haman, who made a, a gallows out of wood where someone would be hanged. That's a gallows. 
where made the gallows out of wood, where Mordecai would be hung and the people of God would subsequently be destroyed. And yet God turned that on its head and Haman was hung and the people of God went free. And we looked at how that foreshadows, aren't you thankful that Jesus, cursed is every man who hangs on a tree. Jesus was hung on a tree, not by his neck, but he was hung on a tree by Romans crucifixion. And he became a curse for us that indeed we might go free. And that's good news, yeah. isn't it? So now we fast forward to the New Testament tonight. We're going to be in two different passages tonight. And I call this two feasts compared. These aren't just little meals. These are meals where you can eat as much as you want. Somebody say hallelujah. Yeah, right. Hallelujah. Right. Where you can eat as much as you want. And there were leftovers at the end. And, but there were thousands of people involved. Now I know if you're one of the ones doing cooking for tomorrow, aren't you thankful there's not thousands coming over to your house? Somebody say hey. You know, yeah. I know you like to see your family, you know, uh, but uh, but you're also uh, thankful there's not a thousand of them. What would you do, right? All the preparation that goes into getting everything done. And uh, I don't cook. I, I've got the eating thing down, but I don't cook, so I can't really relate. I try to help my wife while I can to chop up things, but she's the cook. I'm, I'm the eater. But at any rate, uh, aren't you glad there's not thousands coming? With that having been said, don't you who are doing the dinner wish that you had... Uh, the, the power, as did Jesus, to make a little, feed everybody, and, and just have it done like that, right? So we're going to read two places about that, where the 5,000 were fed, and where the 4,000 were fed, and we're going to contrast, that is, tell how they're different, and compare, means tell how they're the same, tonight, for the Meaningful Meals Message, Part 4, which is our first foray, our first endeavors into the New Testament. John chapter 6, verses 1 to 14, this is the feeding of the 5,000. This, by the way, is recorded in every single gospel. Matthew, Mark, and Luke called the synoptic gospels. That means with one eye. They're very similar in a lot of respects, although they do have their distinctions. No contradictions, just distinctions. But, uh, uh, but John tends to be, a, it reads quite a bit different. And not, again, no contradictions. It's just God inspired John to write things that were distinct and unique to the gospel of John. But this particular Miracle is written in all four Gospels of feeding of the 5,000. And we've chosen John's version for this. John chapter 6, verse 1. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Therefore, Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii, that's two hundred days' wages, worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish. What are these for so many people? Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in that place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Jesus then took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated. Likewise also the fish, as much as they wanted, as much as they wanted. Verse 12, when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Now the feeding of the four thousand is only found in two gospels, Mark and Matthew. It's not found in Luke and John. So Mark chapter 8 verses 1 to 12, this is the feeding of the four thousand. In those days, when there was again a large crowd and they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples and said to them, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from a great distance. And his disciples answered, Where will anyone be able to find enough bread here in this desolate place to satisfy these people? And he was asking them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. And he directed the people to sit down on the ground, and taking the seven loaves, he gave thanks and broke them and started giving them to his disciples to serve to them, and they served them to the people. They also had a few small fish, and after he had blessed them, he ordered these to be served as well, 
And they ate and were satisfied, and they picked up seven large baskets full of what was left over, the broken pieces. About 4,000 were there, and he sent them away. And immediately he entered the boat with his disciples and came to the district of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, Why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. So two meals here. The feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000. Now, I say this, it's not only good for the 29-year-olds in here, but for the young people too. Uh, you grow up uh, due to the young people in a day and time where there, there's always been uh, persecution and there's always been those who deny the existence of God and deny the veracity that is the truthfulness of Scripture. There's always been those who have done that, but I will tell you, during your day and time, you face it perhaps more than in times past, I think, as I look over the course of time. And there'll be those who ridicule the Bible who will say, ah, this is just the feeding of the 4,000 is just another version of the feeding of the 5,000. And they're just putting it in there, just mixing it all up together. And people that do that, they usually, they're critics of the Bible who like to attack the truthfulness of Scripture. But if you study in depth, which they tend not to do, if you study in depth, you'll see there's lots of differences between these two things that make them dif different in how they occur. One, of course, the numbers. One is 5,000 and the other is 4,000. Now, if you read the scriptures, the gospels that record both of the, of the meals, you will find that the feeding of the 5,000 came before the feeding of the 4,000. If someone was wanting to make up a story to prove how great Jesus was, it would be the feeding of the 5,000 and then the feeding of the 25,000. They won't go down in number. How many know if someone makes up a story, not that you ever would, you've heard others make up stories. And when they tell a story, that fish was this long. And then the next time, that fish was this long. And then the next time, they don't even have arms to get paid. How many know the stories get bigger, don't they? Right? Nobody tells a story says, the first time, that fish was this long. And then they said, that fish was really only this. Nobody ever does that. Even when they're called on the carpet, maybe somebody's got pictures. They deny it to the, to the end, right? Well, can I tell you, if someone wanted to make this up, it would be 4,000 and then you build up the 5,000, but it's the opposite way around. 5,000 comes first and then the 4,000. Now, I will tell you, when we have 5,000 and 4,000 that are fed, it said that's the number of men. That doesn't include women and children, so there could have been multiple more thousands that were fed. But the numbers that are mentioned specifically are 5,000 and one and 4,000 and the other. Other distinctions that we have, the feeding of the 5,000 happened around the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. Those are synonymous. That means they mean the same thing. They're used interchangeably in Scripture. Sea of Galilee, Sea of Tiberias. And that was in a Jewish region. So those 5,000 people, the 5,000 men, along with the women and children who would have been there, they would have been primarily Jewish as far as their natural descendants or lineage. When you come to the feeding of the 4,000, it happened in a region called Decapolis. Decapolis is a Gentile area. So one, the feeding of the 5,000 happens in a Jewish region. The feeding of the 4,000 happened in a Gentile region. I mean, those are very important distinctions when you study history. Those places would have been very separate. Also, if you notice, in the feeding of the 5,000, how were they fed? Well, of course, Jesus fed them ultimately, but there were five loaves and two fishes that a young lad had brought for his food, and those things were multiplied to give to the people. And then, when you come to the feeding of the 4,000, it's not five loaves and two fishes. They have seven loaves and a few fish. No specific number is given. How many of those are important distinctions? They're differences. These are not the same uh, thing, just rehashed. No, they happen in two different places, just like Scripture says they did. Scripture gives the details for those willing to study and to learn them and to know them. There's important details that show these are indeed are distinct events. When you have the feeding of the 5,000, everybody gets as much as they want. And at the end of it, there are 12 baskets that are left over. Now, baskets in the Greek that's left uh, from the feeding of the 5,000, little basket, like a lunchbox. So you had 12,000, uh, they would carry two meals in this basket. So maybe as big as two lunchboxes, we might think of it in one basket. 12 of those were left. But when you come to the feeding of the 4,000, it says seven baskets. Now, in the English, it's the same word basket. But in the Greek, 
The seven baskets are big baskets. You can put a man inside of a basket. Some of you will be familiar with uh, Apostle Paul being let down in a basket in the book of Acts. That's the basket full that's left over at the feet of the fourth house. So seven huge baskets left over. So I mention all that to say this. If you ever hear somebody mention this, and, and so many times uh, people don't want to, unfortunately even pastors sometimes don't want to like, for lack of a better phrase, defend the Bible or apologetics they call it. Uh, the Bible is true. And when it says the Bible says, the Bible doesn't lie to you. The Bible tells you the truth. If you all want to learn lies, go to Facebook and Twitter and these kind of places for that. But if you want to learn the truth, go to the pages of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Revelation, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and all the people said amen. amen. Now, if you got Facebook or something that's dealing with those sort of things, but you know what I mean. Worldly things, the world lies. Do they not? But God's word will always tell you the truth. And especially with the more young people being in here tonight, I wanted to be sure and mention those important distinctions because the Bible is true. To say the Bible says, and if that's really what the Bible says, that's the truth of the matter. But now, to look at these, you know how I like words that start with the same letter. And so tonight, the first thing we're going to look at, the first main point is going to be this. The reason the people came to dinner. How many of you Some of you got relatives coming over tomorrow and they're coming over to your house for dinner. They want you to cook them. No. <laughs> or they're coming to your house for dinner and maybe they invited you because they know that you're going to bring the famous pumpkin. I love pumpkin pie. Somebody say, help us, Lord. Pumpkin pie. Amen. 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 <laughs> but, uh, and, 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 or the pecan pie, they want your recipe. Or whatever. People come for different reasons. Sometimes you invite people over to your house because, again, maybe you want them to bring something or you invite people over to your house because you're related or you invite people over to your house because you feel obligated or you invite people over to your house for dinner because you have such an affection and you really want to get together with folks. Amen. There's different reasons, right? Well, can I tell you, if you study these two, the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, the people that are involved, they have different reasons for being there. If you read the feeding of the 5,000 from John chapter 6, they were there, and, and they were there just a brief period of time. All this happened in one day's period of time, as far as them being there and him feeding them. It says that they were gathered there. Why? It, and again, I won't go and read the verses again, but read John chapter 6, verses 1 to 14, Mark 8, 1 to 12, and you'll see that we're recounting them just as we read them. Is that John chapter 6 says the 5,000 people, they were there because they saw Jesus do all kind of miracles. And they knew, hey, if he did these miracles, maybe he can do what I need too. And so they were there but for that particular reason. They weren't necessarily there because they loved Jesus. They weren't necessarily there because they wanted to hear him teach. In fact, if you read the rest of John chapter 6, by the end of it, most of these people, they're going the other way. And there's 12 left. And Jesus says to them, are you going to leave too? And Peter says, we know that you alone have the words of eternal life. Yeah. And even one of those 12 who stayed was a devil. And so you read John chapter 6. And again, the numbers, the chapter and verses were added later after the gospels were written. But John 6, 66. You can remember that one, right? It says that so many of these people that claim to be the son, they turned and followed him no more. Why? They liked the miracles, they liked being fed, but they didn't want to hear his teaching, and they wouldn't receive him as being the Messiah, as being the living bread down of, out of heaven, as being the one that if you didn't put your trust in him, you would have no eternal spiritual life. They turned and they rejected him. So these were people that were there at Jesus' not house, but at Jesus' meeting. Why? Because they liked the miracles and they liked the bread, but they didn't so much care about his teaching. When you look to the 4,000, though, and this is interesting because the 5,000 was at a Jewish region. They, they had more uh, familiarity with the Word of God by far. But when you come to the Gentile region, the 4,000 in the capitalist recounted in Mark chapter 8, those 4,000, it says that they had been there three days listening to Jesus' teaching. Now, did they all become believers? I, that would be a stretch. But when you read the two accounts, you definitely get a different picture. 
The 5,000, we're here for the miracles. We're here for the bread. The 4,000, we're here listening to what Jesus has to say. Who has ever spoken like this before? And they're there for three days. In fact, the 4,000, that one, when, at, when Jesus fed them, he was concerned they might faint on the way home. Now, I've gone with him. Brother Todd accused me of it on Sunday. Bless his heart. I came out of the fellowship hall door. Brother Todd, he's out there. He sees me because if that pastor preaches in and on, I mean, I just, I'll forgive him. <laughs> he was just teasing with me. But, but at any rate, I, I would tell you, I forgive him. He was just teasing with me. He actually wanted me to preach all three parts of a series in one Sunday. And I said, I don't know how many people will go for that now, brother. <laughs> but at any rate, he preached so long to them for three days. He thought if he sent them home, they were going to faint on the way. Now, I've kept you from the cracker where on a Sunday morning, but never from where I thought you were going to faint on the way. <laughs> All right, I just thought, I've always knew you could get to the Cracker Barrel, all right? It's just down the street here. But these people, they are listening to Jesus' teaching. They are there. And when you study the two, it seems that these folks, their motives seem a whole lot shallow, shallower than these folks who are there listening for three days, and he hasn't even fed them yet. Over here, he feeds them on the same day. Can I tell you, motivations matter, don't they? Don't motives matter? I was listening to just to parts of a couple sermons during the past few days. And there was one uh, uh, message that was coming. And what the preacher was doing, and he had a lot of good advice. He was telling people how to make their relationships better. He had the five C's or something of relationships. And then he attached a scripture verse on the end to make it all kind of tie into scripture a little bit. But he was telling them that, don't you want to be a fulfilled person? Don't you want to be happy? Don't you want to not be a person with regrets? And how do they know? We want to, don't we want to be nice people? I mean, relatively speaking, right? We want to be nice people. We want to have relationship without regrets. We want to be one that, you know, our family loves us and other people like us and this sort of, but he is giving this message and there is no tie in to the cross, which says, why is it that we want to be people with good relationships? And how can you? Because God says, if you don't forgive, he won't forgive. And if you are forgiven, you should have a heart that wants to forgive. There was no tie back to any scriptural commandment or any scriptural motivation. It was simply, don't you want to be a better person? Don't you want to be a joy? How many know? Ultimately, what that does is it takes us away from the top two commandments. You're not, he wasn't teaching them to have good relationships and be forgiving because they love God and wanted to obey his command. It's because they wanted to be better people and, and, and be happier. Nor was he telling them to forgive people and to have good relationships because, well, you care about other, you love other people. No, he's saying you want to have good relationships and be forgiving because if not, well, then you won't be all that you could be. It's an appeal not to love to God, not for love for others, but love for oneself. Ultimately, is what that kind of appeal is. Secondly, I heard another message this week where they were talking about sowing and reaping. How many know scripture does say we reap what we sow? We not see God is not smart. Whatever we reap, that also shall we sow. Whether the spirit of the life or of the flesh and the corruption. How many know that's true? Yes. Galatians chapter 6. That having been said, the person speaking this message was saying that you should sow kindness into others. Why? Because you want kindness for yourself, don't you? They were saying that you should indeed, if, if you wanted, they even went to finance. You want finances? You know, sow finances. They said, only by this sowing and reaping and treating others the way you want to be treated, only in that can you kind of control to some degree your own life. Well, not that there's not good wisdom in so far as wanting to be nice to others and in wanting to sow kindness and in wanting to even to give to the things of God. But can I tell you, there was no mandate back to Scripture saying, hey, the reason why it is that you want to sow kindness is because God has been so kind to you and because of a command and out of loving Him, you want to obey His commandments. There was no appeal because you love others. It was simply, if you treat others better, they'll treat you better. How many motivations do matter? Yes. You need to tie it back in. So much of what can come across that even if it has some wisdom to it, if it's not tied back to scriptural and proper motivations, it's not out of a love for God or a love for others. It's out of a love for us. And how many know we, we tend to love us 
a lot, don't they? That's why, what is it that Jesus said? Love, uh, 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 love your brother or sister as you love yourself. Because we tend to have a lot of love for ourselves. Motivations matter. How many know uh, you, you want to be someone, as do I, not only with the right externals, but with the right internals and with the right motivations. How many know the reasons matter? Yes. And we learn that from here. Next is this. Between, if you study these two passages, the reason that Jesus fed them. Why did Jesus feed them? Well, Jesus fed them because he had compassion upon them. He had mercy upon them. In fact, if you read in Mark 8, the feeding of the 4,000, that's the only place where Jesus himself will say, I have compassion on the people, and I, I want to do this because I have compassion for the people. Now, there are other places in Scripture where the gospel writers will say, Jesus had compassion on the people and did thus and such a thing. But as far as in the mouth of our Lord himself... Uh, he only spoke that when he fed these 4,000 here. But I will tell you, why is it that God would feed the 5,000? Why is it that God would feed the 4,000? Why is it that God would save you if you're a child of God? Why is it that he would give us his word? Why is it that he would give us any kind of blessing? Well, is it because we deserve it? How many know when we think we deserve something, taking something for granted is... is I mean, that's just a killer in a life, isn't it? When you think, I deserve, I'm going to get mine. Anybody says, I, I'm going to get what I deserve. Oh, please read scripture. <laughs> I remember there was one brother I knew many years ago, and I don't know that his intention was wrong, but he would always come into services. I'm going to get mine, and he'd come into service. And again, I don't know that his intention was bad necessarily, because he, he seemed to have a lot of love. I think, for God and for others. But that particular phrase, I, I thought, oh, no, no, no. You don't want to get what's coming to you. <laughs> Not based on your own works, that is, anyway. All right? What do we want? We want mercy. We need mercy. Aren't you thankful? The most repeated description of God in the Old Testament, Exodus 34, 6, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, abounding in loving kindness and truth. Aren't you thankful we have a compassionate God. Amen. One who sent his son when we didn't deserve him. A son who died upon the cross when we didn't deserve him. The spirit of God who would come and convict us of sin and, and draw us into Christ if indeed you're a child of God. We didn't deserve. If God would have destroyed us all and started all over on Mars, there's no one who could say he did wrong. How many are thankful he's compassionate? Amen. Why did he feed these people? Because they deserve. You, now listen, I will tell you. When I look at these two, I think, well, the 5,000, they really didn't deserve it. Remember our talk about motivation just a moment ago? And they seem to have not necessarily the best. But the 4,000, they surely didn't. You mean the God who gave you life doesn't deserve three days plus? And we think somehow we've earned Aren't you thankful the Lord God is compassionate and gracious, abounding in loving kindness and truth? So, the reason they came, the reason Jesus fed them, the next will be this. The righteousness that Jesus showed. And what I mean by righteousness that he showed is because of this. He took upon himself. Out of compassion, to be sure. But it showed his righteousness. Then what did he do? He fed these people. He fed the 5,000, even though most of them, by the end of the chapter, would go the other way. He fed the 4,000, even though for sure, though their motivation seemed to be more proper. And I don't have any numbers on it, but I doubt you have 4,000 and at the end of it, all of them are genuine followers of Christ. That's just usually not the case. I don't know that. That's a speculation for me. But he came and he fed them. He took upon himself. And by him doing that, it showed compassion, yes, but it also showed how righteous God is. God is righteous, isn't he? Amen. And you know, righteous, when we think of righteousness, and rightly so, we think of moral character. And that he's not lacking in any way. That he never does any wrong. And that's true about righteousness. But it also, righteousness shows how great God is. Do you know that, and I've mentioned this many times, there are people today, and you know them from the young to the old, all right? You know them. You've seen people that they never use the name of Jesus unless it be in profanity. 
Now we know that's true. And yet they ate today just as good as us, maybe better than us, <laughs> depending upon what their circumstance is. They breathe bread, air. They breathe bread. They breathe air. My words run together. But they breathe air today, didn't they? Because they're still alive. Who gave them that food? Who gave them that air? The same God who gave you food and air today. And can I tell you, those who only use his name as profanity or never put their trust in him, if it is that they do not repent and put trust in Christ before it's everlasting too late, the fact that God in his righteousness treated them so well and provided for their needs will only add to their condemnation when they stand before a holy God who has dispensed his righteousness and his mercy and his many gifts. Can you imagine the accountability? Yeah, and what I mean by that is this. As a preacher, I would say, you hope that people hang on your every word. You hope that people, you know, they get encouraged and they get inspired and they learn more of the truth and that they're on board with you. But can I tell you, anybody who's preached the gospel more than half a time knows that there are many people that turn and go the other way, aren't there? Brother Michael? True. Brother Todd? True. They turn and they go the other way. Perhaps why? I don't know the numbers on it. Y'all don't know either. But I will tell you this, they can turn and go the other way. And we think, oh, and that can hurt your feelings because you really, you want them to come to know Christ as Savior. I don't keep you from witnessing to them the next time. <laughs> but still, it can be. But can I tell you, I am not the world's best preacher. I am not the world's uh, best anything. But Jesus is. And when he preached in John chapter 6, and almost all of them go the other way. Can you imagine? It's one thing if you were to turn away from a message that's preached by a preacher. But to turn away from something preached by Jesus himself? After he fed you? Can you? And did miracles for you? Can you imagine the accountability for that? How many things would be pretty, pretty high? Pretty high. <laughs> and yet, God in his righteousness... That is that he always does what is right. That he provided for them. No one will be able to stand before God and say that somehow they come up with some excuse. They stand without excuse, says the book of Romans. And here it is. The righteousness that Jesus showed. The righteousness. Next is this. Now I had to, I had to stretch a little bit. Because you know I like all, words that start with the same letter. So the reason the people came... The reason Jesus fed them, the righteousness Jesus showed, here's the last one, or the next to last one, the regency Jesus showed. He said, oh, regency? Yeah, I had to go for an R word. <laughs> regency means having to do with something of a king. And I know Jesus is the king. Amen. I love that song that we sing. It's an old Andre Crouch song. He has a lot of good songs. He said, soon and very soon we are going to see the Soon and very soon we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon we are going to see the king. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the king. The king. Not a lot of people think about Jesus in that aspect, unfortunately. They hear the name of Jesus, and if they know that name, if they, they think of someone dying upon a cross, they think of maybe someone rising from the dead, and I hope that they do. But do understand this. He is king of kings and lord of lords. Amen. He is the king. And I will tell you. The regency Jesus showed. And what I mean by that is this. It did not matter. That 5,000 again. That was the men. With women and children it might have been 20. 25,000. But it could have been 25 gazillion. And it wouldn't have mattered. He could take that five loaves and two fish. Because he is a king. And he could cause it to meet every, every need that was there. How many know that's true? Yes. And it didn't matter again, the 4,000 of how many ever women and children were there. It could have been 4 gazillion. All right? It could have been how many ever, innumerable amount. And yet he could have taken those seven loaves and a few fish and fed them all with all kind of leftover. Yes. Why? Because he is the king. Yes. And what he says goes. Can I tell you? The king, he showed he had the power over nature. Why? Because he is the God of creation. 
He's the one who created it all. In the beginning was the Word, speaking of Jesus. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning of God. All things were made by Him, and apart from Him was not anything made that was made. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the King of creation. His regency He showed when He multiplied this to feed the multitude. Jesus would often show glimpses of His regency over devils. He would cast out devils. And the devils would ask for permission. It says he granted them permission. In the gospel of Luke, it says he cast out devils by the finger of God. Just the finger. Hey, I, my mom, she didn't even have to. She had to look. How many of you have parents with a look? And when she gave me that look, I knew that. Yes, ma'am. Whatever it was, I wanted to say yes to it. The look. But you think about it, those were just the, the thing, just the point. Jesus, why? Why did they have to plead? Because he's the king. He's the king. When Jesus walked on water, how is it that he can walk on water? Because he's the king. He does, he's not subject to those sorts of things when he exercises that authority. He is the king. When Jesus stilled the wind and the waves, you know, we get this idea. Jesus stills the wind and the waves, and they'll go, oh, things are so peaceful now. Read the stories. That was not the response. Jesus stilled the wind and the waves, and the disciples are in terror. Why? This one, who is the one with such power that they can still the wind and the waves and walk on water? And they would cower. That's why he would have to tear them. Tell them, fear not. Why? Because Jesus is the king. And one day every eye shall see him. King of kings and Lord of lords. How many know his regency? He is the king. Yeah. Next and finally. The R words. The reasons the people came. The reasons Jesus fed them. The righteousness Jesus showed. The regency Jesus showed. Him being the king. And last is this. And we've already mentioned this to some degree. But the results. John chapter 6, feeding of the 5,000 in a Jewish region where the people would have been more familiar with the Old Testament. And yet, when Jesus feeds them, you keep reading in John chapter 6, and what will happen is many of them will turn and go the other way. And they, they won't end up believing in him. They, they, they will hear. Jesus will tell them, you have to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood or else you have no part with me. And these are people, if you read back in verse uh, 14 of John chapter 6, these are people, again, familiar with the Old Testament. And when Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fishes, they said, this must be the prophet. And if you're familiar with that, that goes all the way back in the Old Testament. Uh, uh, the, the Jews will believe that Moses is the foremost prophet. Moses, he, he gave them the law. Of course, God gave the law, ultimately, but that's the way it's viewed. He gave them the law, did Moses. And they view Moses as the utmost prophet. But Moses said this, there's coming the prophet after me. And that prophet is greater than Moses. That's prophet with a capital P. And that was Jesus, the Messiah who was to come. So these people, they get the loaves and the fishes and they see the miracles and they say, truly, this is the prophet. Then he teaches them and they reject that. Again, how many think that accountability is pretty high? Now, were there some who, who no doubt... Later on, God would convict them and perhaps they would come to a belief of, perhaps, we don't know what happened there. But again, a sad tale that's told in John chapter 6. When you come to Mark chapter 8, he does the feeding of the 4,000 for a Gentile. And how many are thankful Jesus, Jesus did much foray into Gentile lands. But how many are thankful that Jesus died for the sins of the world and that he broke down the dividing wall, most important, between God and man, but even between Jew and Gentile. How many are thankful for that? Yeah. But here it is, is that Jesus does this miracle in a, in a Gentile land of, of feeding them. And we're not sure exactly what their response was. We know that they stayed there for three days until he fed them while he taught them various things. But then he feeds them, but then he leaves that place, and he goes to a place where the, the, the Pharisees, if you read up here, look verse 11. The Pharisees came out after he had done this miracle and, and left the Gentile region. The Pharisees come out and begin to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. When you just fed 
4,000 with seven loads and a few fish, how many think that would be a pretty good sign? Pretty good sign. But they missed the sign. They didn't, they did the religious leaders by and large. And they said, show us another sign. It was never enough. Never enough. But can I tell you, they will stand accountable for that. Now, did is it that some of them, from each category, some of those folks, no, no doubt, would, would come to, but not all of them would come to faith by any stretch of the imagination and were, were given to believe that in John chapter 6 it was maybe nobody ultimately, but we don't know. But God does all these miracles and there's varying results. Someone who said, I heard someone say, a miracle settles the issue. There are people who pray for miracles and miracles happen and they might even give glory to God for half a minute, but then when they ultimately they have hearts that are, are, are away from God and they don't want to repent of sin and put trust in Christ and they can justify it away in all sorts of ways. How many have seen that before? People, something great happens for them and they say, yay! And then they go the other way. But here it is, is that, that uh, uh, a miracle doesn't necessarily settle the issue so far as a person like these Pharisees can always say, I want more, I want more, I want more. I would thankful God has given us his word. He's convicted with his spirit. And here it is. The results. Some of those folks, no doubt, came to believe. Some of those folks were very grateful. Some of those folks had right motivation. Other folks were, well, what have you done for me lately? How many want to have the right response to the king? Amen. Let's stand our feet tonight. Father, we come before you tonight. We thank you for these passages of scripture that we've looked at briefly here tonight to compare and contrast. And Lord, there's so much to learn and to glean from your word. As we've looked at it here tonight, the reason the people came, well, some came because they wanted some miracle. They wanted just fed. And Jesus did feed and do many miracles even for those with wrong motivations because he is so righteous and so loving. There were some that came with motives of wanting to hear what it was that was said and their hearts were transformed and they came to faith in Christ. God, it is our desire tonight that we, your people, would have hearts that are transformed and have the fruit of the Spirit evident in our lives that we would be people of right actions, yes, with right motivations, that is to glorify you, O Lord. Lord, we pray tonight as it was that Jesus showed the reason that he fed them was out of compassion, out of mercy. May we never forget that the blessings of which we have received as children of God primarily, first and foremost, always, that of salvation is not because we deserved it or because we earned it or because we could pay for it or because our position demanded it. No, it's because God is merciful, compassionate, gracious. May we not forget that for indeed that simple truth alone will cause us to be more grateful and less demanding, so to speak. God, I pray tonight that we would all know and realize that you are the regent. That is, you are the king. You are the one who is in charge, not us, you. And I pray that we would not forget that. As we read your word, we would take it with the seriousness of coming from not just a king, but the king, the king of kings. Lord, I pray that we would follow after you and grow in you and give glory to you with all that we have and all that we are for all of our days. That's the heartbeat of the child of God. And we thank you that you feed us, yes. You feed us your word. You supply of your spirit. Lord, even of natural things, of natural food, of natural shelter, of natural Whatever the blessing may be of which we have enjoyed and do continue to enjoy, it comes from your almighty hand and may we not fail to give you the praise. And Lord, tonight, finally, if there be any here tonight that have not submitted to the King, they've not repented of sin and put trust in Him, I pray that your Holy Spirit will convict of sin, righteousness, and of judgment, that indeed hearts would be attuned to how indeed they have rebelled against the law of the King through lying, through Self-love instead of genuine love for God through uh, uh, coveting, breaking of your commandments of various and sundry kinds. I pray that your spirit will convict. And I pray, dear God, as well, that they would be convinced of Jesus, who indeed gave his life upon the cross to provide 
Not just natural life that was supplied by bread and bones, but spiritual life that was supplied by His broken body, His shed blood. And if there are any that know not Christ tonight, I pray they come to something like this. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. You, Jesus, are the only Savior. Make me your child. Lord, be with each and every one tonight. Pray each and every one has a blessed Thanksgiving. I pray we, your people, are always grateful unto your God. We give you all the praise and all the glory, both now and evermore. In Jesus' name we pray, in the power of the Spirit we come, and all of God's people said, Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. May He lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. May you know it is the hope you're calling of God in Christ Jesus and the surpassing greatness of His power extend to all who believe. Amen and Amen. Amen. God bless you tonight in Jesus' name.